Welcome to the City Lit Festival. It's been a morning, hasn't it? <laughs> We are so thankful to have you here this morning. I'm Carla Dupre, the Executive Director of City Lit Project. Along with your beautiful faces, we get to celebrate the return to our first live event since November 2019 with Mother Nature's full-blown winter angst in our face. How about that? <laughs> it's been one of those days. Yesterday, some of us, spring ready and anxious, wore our sandals. Now here we are today, bundled up against a bomb cyclone. March in Maryland, hand in hand, working with anything is possible. But today, you who are among the brave are with us, and that's good enough for me. Shall we begin? Before I introduce our first guest, the curator of this remarkable series, Becoming American, who will also deliver our land acknowledgement, there are a few announcements I need to make. I wanna thank our old and new partners, the Enoch Pratt Free Library, thank you. But I wanna thank you for making this literary celebration one of our finest yet, truly one where we embarked on a journey of collaboration, where at the center of it all was the idea of celebrating a phenomenal work of investigative journalism from the creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who you will hear from later today in conversation with, with Baltimore's own Martha S. Jones. I'd like to say you're in for a treat. Before I mention those partners, please join me in thanking my family, Big Al and Danielle Dupre for living through this festival season with me. <laughs> it's been a trip. And my City Lit Project board, a little bit more than a handful of literary stewards who have championed for literature in Baltimore City for years. Dana Harris Travato, Brian Lyles, Bunky Marker, Chelsea Lemon Fetzer, Aditya Desai, and Tracy Diamond, and our City Lake Gladiator, Baptism by Fire, by Festival Fire, Joe Massa. <laughs> Please, yes, they deserve it. I also want to thank our leadership council, my go-tos when I need guidance or questions answered quickly. Kate Markert, Judy Cooper, Greg Woham, who couldn't join us today, Chick Dumbog, who is always with us in spirit, and E. Scott Johnson. Most of our partners for this festival, but most especially for today's event, are new to City Lit. We thank them from their generous support of this festival and their hands in spreading the word about our month-long virtual and live City Lit Festival. Please join me in thanking them too, Maryland Centers for Creative Classrooms, Maryland Humanities, Arts Education in Maryland Schools, Motor House, Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, Busboys and Poets Baltimore, Be More Art, our media sponsor, we have magazines, they're probably the most celebrated art magazine that in, in Baltimore. You need to pick up a copy. I think we'll have free ones out later today. Um, their work is a stunning work of art, a magazine that shows the heartbeat of the creative community in Maryland. The More is More issue where they highlighted me and City Lid has sold out, people. <laughs> What's not to love? But there are other issues available to you. We guarantee you, you'll love it like we do. Other partners, the Ivy Bookshop, who will be selling books today on the second floor of the library. Um, joyful signing, our ASL interpreters from um, our virtual events. Sister with the Bike Travel, who helped me unmercifully today <laughs> trying to get our keynote speaker here. And definitely Enoch Pratt Free Library. But we also want to thank our graphic design company, Inside 180. These beautiful programs that you see today, please read them. It's um, uh, the owner of a small graphic design company in Ellicott City who adopted us many years ago as their nonprofit. We want you to read that hefty program. You'll see all the love and hard work we have put into this month long festival. It's like a literature, it's like a love letter to the Baltimore literary community that we do literature in Maryland on a grand scale. Real talk, I have to say these past few years, we've been on a journey. <laughs> We have listed our, our founders, our funders, I mean, Maryland State Arts Council, Maryland Humanities, Baltimore Office of Promotion of the Arts, Creative Baltimore Fund, T. Rowe Price Foundation. There are so many. We also have been recognized by national organizations like the National Endowment for the Arts, like Amazon Literary Partnership and National Endowment for Humanities. They are all listed in our program and we are so thankful. They are the reason that we are still here despite a pandemic and despite fighting waves of what remains to be a racial pandemic. They, my friends, have sustained us and we're forever grateful. Months ago, I received a message from Laura Weiss from the Maryland State Arts Council, who knows at City Lit, writers are dear to our heart. And when they moved to Maryland and to Baltimore in particular, we aim to scoop them up into the folds of our literary happenings. But this particular author, Sama Adil Sawat, 
the author of American Muslim, wanted to gather women and ask them about their journey as immigrants. After we spoke, I told Sama, I love the idea of it, but at CityLid, it's got to be about real life, genuine stories of what it felt like to be other. We wanted her to bring to us the brave but vulnerable women who would step forward and tell us it wasn't always so pretty. It wasn't always so embracing. In fact, it could be everything but that. We want those stories. We wanted her to hold up a mirror to show us what we look like receiving immigrants to America. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show you a film right now, and then we will honor the um, curated work of Sama Adil Sawat, who will introduce these fierce women today on our stage and who will deliver our land acknowledgement. Thank you.
think I was just, I think I was just there and then she was like, oh, it's time to go back to the Thank you to all the volunteers for making this possible. Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Saima Adil Sitwat. Thank you for joining us for the panel on Becoming American at the 19th Annual City Lit Festival. Ali Balkazar, whose video you just saw, was part of the initial documentation of 10 stories of immigrant women from Maryland. She had us off to a great start and I'm sure gave you a great, a good idea of what this project has been about. Before we formally start, I would like to begin to, uh, today's session by acknowledging that the land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. We are currently on the traditional lands of the Piscataway people who have stewarded it throughout generations. To make this a more meaningful practice, if you live in this region, we respectfully ask you to consider learning more about the Piscataway Kwane tribe, the people where the rivers blend, and to invent, invest energy in learning more about the land buyback movement for tribal nations. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their distant homes in the hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We acknowledge we are standing on ancestral lands, and we honor the thousands of enslaved Africans whose lives were physically and spiritually stolen. We pay respect to the elders, past and present. I myself uh, recently became of these historical facts thanks to Maryland Estates Arts Council Land Acknowledgement Project and Carla Dupree, who has been uh, using uh, these statements and uh, knowledge in her uh, remarks for our City Lit Festival. And I do encourage you to check out Maryland State Arts Council's resource. I would like to start the session on finding belonging in America by acknowledging lives and stories of our American ancestors people who lived and toiled these lands much before we came to inhibit it. This also confirms my conviction in storytelling. Our stories document time and place in a community. Our stories are our truths that will live in the future long after, after our material existence is gone. Our lived experience will one day become the stuff of history classes for posterity to analyze and draw lessons from. Hence, we must tell our stories, our truths. For me, writing my memoir, American Muslim, An Immigrant's Journey, was the first step in confronting my own truths. Patriot Act was always part of my American dream right from the beginning. And yet, like most immigrants, I kept my head down and adapted. I tried my best to become an American. I learned to read temperature in Fahrenheit ate broccoli, and replaced my cup of chai with coffee only to replace it once again when Starbucks came out with chai tea lattes. But in the end, I was still an other. My skin color, accent, my fully clothed body on the beach all gave me away. Becoming American Project is an effort to document a piece of our history and highlight what it means to be an immigrant or first-generation American in present-day United States. The project is inspired by many stories that I had the privilege to know firsthand in my own immigrant bubble. I have been surprised at the ease with which many immigrants, especially women, talked about the trauma that they had endured being away from their family, religion, and culture, and yet they find hope. They march forward with enthusiasm in everyday lives to leave an imprint of their own story on the great American narrative. Becoming American is a tribute to these brave women. The first phase of the project included 10 immigrant women who call Maryland home. 
You can access their inspiring stories of finding belonging in America on my website, saimasitwa.com. There's a YouTube channel which is dedicated to stories uh, like Ale Balcazar's, whom you heard. The uh, YouTube channel also goes by the name of Becoming American, and the stories are also featured on City Lit Project's website. I have been very lucky to find partners and community members who are willing to share their stories, like the four panelists we have with us today. There are others without whose support this project would not have been possible. Carla Dupree and Aditya Desai from City Lit Project are two such people. I'm grateful for Maryland State's Arts Council for the creative grant that supported the project. My friends at Maryland Humanities also supported the project all along from connecting me to the right stories to spreading word about Becoming American panel. And thank you to Enoch Pratt Free Library for hosting us today. We have a great group of women here. Unfortunately, one of our panelists, Nadia Hashmi, could not join us. She lives in the Gaithersburg area, and the roads were not looking good for her this morning. We tried to troubleshoot, but technology was not on our side today. But apart from that, we have with us uh, Iman Kota, who is a writer. Uh, we have entrepreneur Mariam Tucker and policymaker, state delegate Jocelyn Pina Malnik with us. They have come together to share their own and their families' journeys as immigrants to the United States of America and talk about what can we all do to make America an inclusive place for everyone. Our conversation today is even more pertinent as millions of refugees from Ukraine and Afghanistan are forced to flee their homes and try to find a second home in this world. Many are and will be arriving in the United States and we need to make sure that we build bridges and not walls. Here are a few reminders before we formally start our conversation. The authors on our panel will be participating in book signing through the Ivy Bookshop. Uh, for now, that will be Iman and myself. Nadia is not here with us. Book purchase and signing will be available on the second floor of the library after our panel concludes at 11.30 a.m. There will be an opportunity for moderated audience questions at the end of the panel. Please use index cards to share your questions. If your question is selected, we will bring the microphone to you. Also, because of the or weather, the audience is thin, and I'm sure if you have a question, you will have the opportunity to ask it. Please, 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 and this is a special request for me, uh, take some time to fill out and submit the festival forms. We would love to know your thoughts. Your evaluation tells us how are we doing. With that, without any further ado, I would like to ask our first panelist, uh, Maryland State Delegate Jocelyn Pina Melnick, who has represented Prince George's and Anne Arundel counties for past 10 years, to please take the stage and share her story with us. Thank you, and it's really an honor to be with you here. Just, I'm so impressed by all of you, and thank you for making it um, here today. You could have been anywhere else on this very uh, cold day, probably at home, right, with a cup of tea, um, and you came here. So we're very grateful. We do, do not take it for granted. I came to this country when I was eight years old. I was born in Dominican Republic. Um, Dominican Republic uh, is in the Caribbean, a beautiful island, and we shared the island with Haiti. Um, my mom grew up with her um, parents and 11 brothers and sisters and they were very poor. She was the oldest, and uh, she uh, married my dad, and like many immigrants, he came first, and then she came, and then us. Um, we came here because we were looking for an opportunity to do better, right? To get an education, to help our families back home. My parents ended up getting divorced and when I arrived to this country, my mom, my sister and I, my sister and I were 11 months apart. Um, we ended up staying with an uncle. And after a month, um, we were asked to leave. And we ended up then being, ended uh, up living with my mom's friend. She had an apartment in one of her rooms. And like many immigrants, we struggle. We didn't know the, the language. I didn't know one word of English. And my mom didn't and um, speak English, neither did my sister. And as a young eight-year-old coming to this beautiful country, right, land of opportunities, um, I also saw 
the opportunities, but I saw the struggles. My mom was on, on welfare and social services. I remember going when I was eight with her to the office and she will often volunteer me because I learned quickly and I learned English with Sesame Street, uh, Mr. Rogers, if you recall those shows and I will mimic what they were saying. And um, she would volunteer me and I would often find myself at that age translating mostly for women um, and the questions that they were asked, like, where's the father? Why isn't he home? And why do you need help? At that age, at eight years old, they really made me angry where I didn't know why I was angry, but I didn't like the way um, our immigrant uh, women were being treated, our women were being treated. Um, and I decided that young, my mom, at eight years old, my mom will call me the little lawyer and I decided I had to be a lawyer. So I always tell people, be careful with the power of words with your kids because they are impactful. So I learned our struggles and I learned the struggles of trying to be in this country with our beliefs and our values and trying to reconcile them. Um, but my mom was a very strong woman. And when people ask me, where, why are you where you are? because we immigrants have this fire in our belly. You have this sense that you have to make it. You come here, you struggle, and you want to do better. And this is a lovely, beautiful country where you can do that. Um, I actually became um, the first in my family to go to college. I became the first in my family to go to law school and become a lawyer. Um, and as a lawyer, I became a public defender because I wanted to be that voice for our community. And then later on, a prosecutor. Never thought I would run for office. Never. It never crossed my mind, right? I didn't have those examples, those role models. But I did run for office. After having our first son, I stayed home. And I decided to resign from my job as a prosecutor. And I'm not going to even be humble. I was good at it because I work hard. <laughs> I may not be the smartest person in the room, but I will outwork you. And I learned that from my background and my family. And I decided to run for office without, with no support. And uh, there were nine of us running. We door knock on 10,000 doors, did about uh, 8,000 mailings, um, 8,000 um, mailings, and uh, I'm sorry, phone calls, seven mailings. And, and we're out there every single morning. And there were nine of us running for three seats and I came in second. I've been there 15 years. And I can tell you that many of the laws as we discuss, you know, what does becoming American means, looking at your roots, you know, I am in a place where I can make a difference. A lot of my bills are first in the nation. They have been in the New York Times, the Washington Post, this little island girl was able to do that with the opportunities that I have here. So one of my bills last year declared racism as a public health crisis. One of my bills is the first, we created the first lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the country. That was Jocelyn Peña Melnick, okay, that I put in. One of my bills created the first drug affordability board in the nation to look at drug prices. So we can make it. We come here, we contribute to this country. We are American, we have opportunities, but we never forget where we come from. And I'm very much the young girl from that island. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn, for sharing that journey with us. Um, I would now like to invite Iman Koda to talk to us about growing up more as a transnational than an immigrant and how this experience informs your writing, Iman. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I don't uh, always fit the, the, the traditional story of, um, or what people think of the traditional story of immigration. Um, my parents met um, in the late 1960s in San Francisco, um, a very exciting time, an exciting city. My dad had traveled from Mecca, Saudi Arabia, um, where he was born to study. Um, and my mom had grown up outside of San Francisco in a tiny 
town, the kind of town that if you you blink, you miss it. Um, <laughs> her family um, traces its roots back to um, before the American Revolution. They're, um, they have roots in England. Um, my dad's family traces its roots back to India and uh, Hadramaut and other parts of the Middle East. Um, and um, after they met, they moved uh, to Saudi Arabia, um, where I was born. Um, and But within my first year, we moved back to the States so my dad could continue his, um, his studies. So in a sense, I moved, I migrated to my mother's country and I migrated away from my father's country. And then after my father finished his PhD, um, I, one of my brothers was born in the United States. We moved back to Saudi Arabia when I was eight. So I migrated away from my mother's country and to my father's country. Um, and I spoke English at the time. My dad um, even, my dad spoke to us in English growing up because my mother's um, Arabic um, was not that strong. And so they spoke English to each other. So I moved to Saudi Arabia and didn't know that much Arabic and I had to learn it there. So my big, you know, sort of experience of learning to fit in happened not here in the United States where I spoke the language and where I looked white, but in Saudi Arabia where I looked different, although Saudis come in different, you know, colors of skin and different backgrounds. Um, but most people have a single kind of view of what a Saudi looks like. Um, and, and I had to learn the language. Um, and I really can't remember the first couple of years I was there, I didn't really learn Arabic until, um, I was 10 and my father decided that my brother and I should go to an Arabic school instead of the English language school that we were in. Um, you know, my grandmother didn't speak English and I, I don't remember how we communicated, but I, I, I think that we did. You know, like there was, there was a way that we were able to speak to each other without speaking to each other. And eventually I learned her language, but I think, and my grandmother used to travel with us sometimes um, to the United States. Um, and even though she didn't speak, I think the only word of English, she knew two words in English. They were hello and kitty. And so she was saying, kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> Those were the two words she knew. But, so, but I would see her, you know, my parents' friends would, would interact with her. And I would see the way that she connected with people, even though she didn't speak their language. And I think what I learned from that and from my grandmother was that you don't have to speak each other's language to connect with people. Of course, speaking multiple languages has enriched my life. Um, but, um, but I think that it allowed me to, you know, be in a room where I don't understand what people are saying. Um, this happens because my husband is Taiwanese American and his family speaks Mandarin and, um, and I will be in a room and they can speak Mandarin around me. And, you know, I, it's fine. I, it, I don't mind it. And I think the reason I bring this up, I think is the idea of, we talk, I think, a lot in this country about the idea of cultural tolerance. But what does that mean to be culturally tolerant? Um, does it mean that we have to understand everything about each other in order to tolerate each other? Or does it mean understanding that there are sometimes things we're not going to understand and that we should be able to connect with each other despite that? Um, and so, uh, I also think about because of the way that I grew up living in Saudi Arabia from the age of eight until I graduated from high school, but always we always came back to the United States to the Cleveland area um, in the summer that um, and then I went to college um, and I came here um, and I ended up staying. Um, and so for me, immigration that word doesn't really describe my experiences. Migration and movement 
are words that I prefer to use. Um, I think that those words open up the way we think about human movement and migration to more experiences, experiences where you come and go back and then come back again. Um, and that it also connects us to history because people have moved throughout history and each of us has lots of migration stories, I think, in our family backgrounds, whether they're within a country or outside of a country. My father's family um, was in Mecca for many generations. Um, and then in the 1970s, during the oil boom, most of the family moved from Mecca to Jeddah. Now they're a Jeddah family. Um, so there's these, in the United States, we have the um, the great migration, different migration stories within the country as well. Um, and I think if we think of it in this wider way, we don't think of immigrants only as certain people who came to the United States to do certain things, but we think of the way all of us move throughout time within our families. And it becomes a story that we can all be a part of. Um, and that's really important to me, to make that story something we can all be a part of, instead of something that we try to understand about other people. Thank you, Ruth. Um, uh, thank you, Iman. And I also recently read a beautiful piece that Iman wrote, co-authored with her father. And it is about, um, do you want to talk a little bit about it? I can talk about it later. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting piece, and it's available online. So if you know people have the opportunity to see it, I really enjoyed reading that. Our finest final panelist today is Mariam Tucker, who is an entrepreneur and migrated with her family to the United States at the age of six. Mariam's mother is here with us. Her daughters are here with us. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. I also want to extend our sincerest apologies for Mariam for misspelling her last name on the festival flyer. Her name is spelled as T-H-A-K-K-A-R. So our apologies to you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. So half the audience already knows my story, um, but I will go into it for the rest of you. Um, these lovely ladies' stories mimic a lot of mine as well, um, but yet are different. Uh, so when uh, Jocelyn was talking about the land of opportunity for us coming from India, it was more the thought of a land of milk and honey, that everything was just very easy in America and everyone's goal was to come to America to live this great easy life full of money and big houses and fancy cars. And um, so that's what was in our minds um, living in India as a family. Um, my father was one of seven siblings. Um, he was the oldest. All seven of his siblings were already in America when we finally emigrated here. Um, and they were very successful. They all educated themselves here. They were doing great. And we were this last final immigrant family to come. Um, and you know, a degree from India didn't mean, mean much in America. So my parents had to go the much harder route of actually um, getting, you know, the more blue collar jobs um, and struggling to, to make their family of six, four children and two adults find a place here. Um, we also moved in with our uncle when we first came here. Um, and the six of us lived in one bedroom. Um, and, uh, you know, we could tell that we were a burden. We were made, um, it, it, it was very clear that we were, we were perhaps a burden um, for such a large family to move into a home and, and take over space. And so my mom um, really, you know, my mom inspires me on a daily basis, but she, she saw the writing on the wall. And for a woman who had never worked a day in her life, who never left her home once it turned dark, you know, it was a very, she lived a very, um, very cushioned life. Uh, she came here and she um, got a job and that was unheard of. I mean, really, that didn't happen in our family. Women didn't work. And so uh, she got a job. But not only did she get a job, you know, we came at a time when um, there was a lot of the um, child abuse stories on TV. And so my poor mother walked into this country with all these child abuse stories and her four, in her mind, beautiful children. Um, and so she actually found a job working at night so she could be at home and her kids did not have to go to daycare. Um, and so my, my mother, who had never been out at night, even for social occasions, now was working at night um, and in a photograph um, processing factory. 
uh, so that she could be home with her children during the day. And she was that mom who would, you know, come to our schools in the middle of the day to check to make sure no teacher was abusing us because that was also on TV and it could happen to her kids. So, um, so I, I had a very interesting beginning coming here. Um, but also what I learned watching my mom was that women were far more capable than we were led on to believe. And so um, I had that in my head that there was really nothing that was out of reach and that I couldn't do. Um, I remember when I was 14, I was just waiting to turn 14 so I could get a job and help my parents. I really, really was eagerly looking forward to it. Um, so I turned 14 and my uncle, uh, her brother had just, my mom's brother had just um, immigrated as well. And when I told him, oh, I'm so excited, I can finally work legally, you know, it's, it's allowed now, I'm 14. He said, oh no, women in our family don't work. I don't know what you're thinking, but that's not acceptable. And um, I kind of just looked at him like, hmm, must be nice to sit where you are. But where I'm coming from, I have parents who are working exceptionally difficult jobs, working two, three um, jobs a day to make ends meet for their four children. And so if I can be of any help, that's going to happen. And so I did. I started working when I was 14. And then um, I got my first official, official job uh, when I was 16. And from that time on, um, I looked at me and my parents as a team, not... Um, not that I was doing them a favor, but that this was just the way we were going to get ahead. And so we were a team, the three of us, um, and we worked really hard uh, to to make that a reality. And to this day, I still consider my parents part of my team, even though I'm married and I have three children. Um, but still, uh, I, I look at us as as one unit, and I've never ever stopped looking at it like that. But my my biggest struggle, I think, was. Um, watching my my brothers adapt this in this country um, and struggling with their identity because you know they wanted to be Americans so bad and I and my sister were very comfortable being Indian Americans but they just wanted to be American I remember my mom coming in her Indian clothes to my brother's graduation and my brother kind of walking past her like he didn't know her <laughs> because he was just kind of embarrassed of the fact that she showed up in her Indian clothes and um, so when we talk about uh, you know culture and and accepting our culture, but also wanting to be a part of this new culture that you've come to. I think some people process it better than others, and some people are able to walk that line on both sides, and some aren't, and some want to choose just one way or the other. Um, so some people want to just become American, and some people just want to stay their mother culture, and then me and my sister kind of walk more of that middle line of sometimes here and sometimes there. Um, and it's uh, another part of that was you know, I didn't wear my headscarf back when I was growing up. So if you look at me or you look at my sister, we are very American looking. You couldn't really tell where we're from. You know, I grew up, people thought I was Spanish or people thought I was Jewish. People thought I was Russian, but nobody thought I was Indian. Um, and it was a very interesting dynamic growing up because I was too, quote unquote, brown to be American, but too white to be Indian. And so I never really kind of was able to find a place in the Indian circle of school's friends or in the American circle of school friends because they kept identifying me with the other. So I was always this other, but I never knew what other I was because I couldn't really find an other to fit into. And then a big change um, that came into my life was when I did start wearing the headscarf. I was an adult. I had my oldest daughter already at that point. Um, and I, it was post 9-11. Uh, and I started wearing my headscarf, and I couldn't believe the change in attitudes towards me. Um, and it was instantaneous. So it was, you know, I'm that girl that walks through Walmart saying hello to people um, as I walk past them or asking how their day is going. And whereas before I would get, you know, a smile or a courteous response back, I actually started getting dirty looks or no response as they walked past me, um, clearly acknowledging that they've heard me, but not, not you know, actually responding. Um, so there's been a, a real trajectory of, of watching different influences of culture um, affect me in my life uh, from, again, not belonging in either circle growing up um, and then, you know, starting the headscarf and, you know, clearly being identified as a Muslim in a post 9-11 world. Um, it was a um, it was very eye opening to me that I, interestingly, no matter how long I've been here and we've been here 38 years. 30, 38 years, yes, 38 years. So the majority of my life, I was six years old when we came here. Um, but yet still, even to this day, I couldn't tell you that I truly feel like I fit in here. 
uh, which is sad because I've come a long way and I've done a lot of things and I run my own business and we own another business and uh, we, we do a lot of cool, fascinating things, but yet I've never been able to feel like this is my home, which is a really sad thing for, for an immigrant 38 years into the story. Um, and that's my story. Thank you, Mariam. And thank you to all of you for sharing your with in such truth and honesty. I would like to start. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. I would like to start with something that you said, Mariam, to me during our initial conversation. And that was, and you also brought it out right now, which is being different is difficult. And especially for adolescents, for people who are growing up and in that space of otherness. And uh, I would love to uh, hear how do you navigate that space? And what is it like? So for me, I think it was coming to accept that I'm very different and um, that I'm never going to 100% fit in. And so once you accept that, you kind of work around it and you don't let that become a hindrance anymore. So. Um, for example, when, um, when I, when we went to virtual, uh, so one of the things I struggle with again with the headscarf, I'm, I'm a wedding planner. Um, and I noticed that, uh, some, some people reacted differently to me, uh, when they would meet me in person versus when they hired me on, over a phone conversation. Um, so I realized that while they, they know I'm capable of the job, my physicalness will always affect how people feel about me. Um, and so I've now made that accommodation in my life where I try to always have a phone conversation first and uh, let them get to know me before they identify me just in this one singular bucket of, oh, she's Muslim. Um, so that's that's helped. It's just adapting. It's adapting and understanding um, that you're going to have to go about it, not ideally the way you'd like to, but finding the right path so that being different doesn't hinder your progress. Iman and Jocelyn, would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in relation to my career as an author, um, where you know when I when I left Saudi Arabia, um, there really wasn't you know, and still isn't a lot, but but things are changing. It wasn't a lot of um, arts. It wasn't much of an art scene or a writing scene, not a lot of publishing. A lot of the publishing that happens in the Middle East is in Lebanon or in Egypt. Um, and so as someone who wanted to be a writer, um, it seemed like the United States was the place to try to do it. Um, and also because of some of the things I wanted to write about, I, at the time, this was many years ago, thought, you know, that I wanted to write for an American audience and change the way that they thought about the Middle East um, and Saudi Arabia. And um, I did not know the huge bur like um, uh, hurdles um, that exist for writers of color in this country. Um, and, and also possibly because when, I, when I'm in this country, I move through the world as someone who passes for white. I hadn't experienced some of what you experienced with those sort of visual differences. So, um, you know, I was surprised when I found that I was, I was trying to get my first book published and I was just getting no after no after no after no. Um, and part of it, I think, is because I was not telling the types of stories that, that people wanted um, about the Middle East. But also because, and I didn't, you know, I, I, I know this now after many years, um, but I didn't at the time how white the publishing industry is. Um, and there was, um, <laughs> someone's nodding their head, there was a, a story that came out in the New York Times in the past couple of years where they looked at, they only looked at you know the, the the big New York publishers, but they looked at all of the fiction that had been published over the past like I can't remember if it was fifty or seventy five years, and they quantified how many of those books were by people of color, and it was it was small. It was like ten, 10 to twenty percent. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I, when I saw that, because I had been through many years of, of no's, I was not surprised that there were a lot of people, I think especially white writers, who were like, what? Um, and it was like, that. well, that's just proof of what we know is true. Um, now things are, are changing both in the United States and in Saudi Arabia. You're seeing much more um, cultural activity happening there. Um, the government and nonprofit organizations promoting those things. Um, I just read the other day the translation of some very short stories by this young Saudi writer who became popular on, on Twitter with her micro stories um, and, and um, have read a, a few books in translation by Saudi writers recently. And also in the United States, I'm seeing that um, you're seeing so many more Muslim and Arab American writers um, being published and being popular. Um, and that's all, all great. And so you asked about difference. And I think that for me, it's been an issue of, of being different in terms of the stories I'm trying to tell and trying to figure, you know, and, and, and trying to figure out how to um, overcome those barriers that, um, that exist in the publishing world without um, sort of, without losing the uniqueness of the stories I wanna tell, without losing that connection to, Arabic literature and um, the Arabic language and the Saudi culture that I want to include in my books. Um, and it, 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 it's a challenge, but I, I see how things, things are changing, um, in, in, it, mostly in, in better ways. Um, but, um, but there's still a long way to go until you see a real good diversity of, of books. Um, you know, there, there's certainly much more than there were like 10 years ago. So Iman, let me just ask you a follow-up question on that. It's, this is interesting what you said about the publishing industry. And do you feel, because like just you said that this Arabic writer um, published micro stories on Twitter because there are so many alternative ways of getting our stories out. Self-publishing is becoming big. There are several platforms, social media. is There are many small presses as well who are working with writers of color. So do you think that it's it's not the traditional public industry which is changing much, but there are just more avenues for writers to get their stories out. Sure, in some ways I think that's true, and I think that there are a lot of. For a while, I was I was watching sort of Arab American novelists and where they were being published, and there were a few who were being published by the big publishers, but many more who were being published by smaller publishers. But what that means is that for um, writers of color, it's always that you have to be more excellent than everybody else, right, in order to, to get that success. And why shouldn't we also, um, you know, be able to make more of a living on our writing than, um, than the smaller publishers can do? I mean, I think, I think it's great to have a variety of ways to be published because, um, you know, the, the New York publishing industry is driven by profits. And so they're not going to publish every, you know, kind of experimental right. thing. Right. Um, but um, there, I think there does need to be change because, you know, you, the, the books that, that more people are reading come out of those presses. Thank you. Jocelyn, can you talk about, uh, as we are talking about this conversation on being different is difficult, uh, your experience of growing up uh, in New York as a 15 year old, and uh, did you grow up in New York? Sorry, I came to this country yeah, yeah, when yeah. I was eight. Right. I stayed for a couple of years, went back to the Dominican Republic, right. came back when I was 14. Yeah. So, so you know, how did uh, this experience of being different shaped your adolescence? And then how did you and if you ever did find belonging in the United States? You know, it's, it, ha it has been a struggle, right? Someone that looks like me. So when you look at me, you know, some people say, are you um, African-American? Are you Indian? Are you Ethiopian? Are you mixed? Right. I have this curly hair. Um, 
And growing up in the Dominican Republic, all I knew was that I was loved by my grandparents and my mother and my uncles. I never really thought about what I looked like, right? The Dominican Republic is a place that is very mixed and we have had different influences. So we do have an issue in the Dominican Republic as well with the color of your skin, especially when you think about Haiti, about Dominicans, about the different influences that we have, which is unfortunate, right? Because it shouldn't matter, we know that. Coming to this country, I felt like when I was growing up um, in my adolescent years, it was hard for me to fit because I didn't fit with most Latinos that are lighter skin and I wasn't accepted. And with the black community as, as an Afro Latina, I wasn't black enough, right? Um, even two years ago, I belong to the Black Caucus for the last 15 years since I have been in the legislature. And I'm also, uh, I'm a proud member of the Latino Caucus, right? Because those are my roots. I don't get this color from being at the beach, right? It goes back to slavery, <laughs> right? So there was a proposition to change the bylaws to make people like myself that are in different caucuses choose one. Mm -hmm. You can't choose one because I'm both. Mm -hmm. I'm all of it. Mm -hmm. So I often find myself in a room feeling like I'm different. Um, and while it took me a while to accept who I am, the more I um, experienced life, the more I read, right? And to be comfortable with who I am, to have that confidence, it takes a lot to get there, okay? Not, not to, um, uh, you know, have low self-esteem, you know, to know truly where you come from and where do you belong. And I think, you know, today at 55, I know who this woman is and that all those struggles and all those experiences, you know, have made me who I am, but it's not easy. Um, thank you. When you're 14, 10, to try to struggle with your identity of, what you think you are and then what others are telling you. And you have to reconcile that and be very strong and have very firm roots, which is very important. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking about how there's also the influence of like, of, of stereotypes and bigotry. And as much as I, you know, I, 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 I grew up with a strong sense of self because of growing up in both my parents' countries and also in Saudi Arabia, I, uh, my family's like sort of core social group were Saudi men married to American or European women. So all of the people, a lot of my friends I grew up with were also um, biracial, bicultural, multinational. And so that was normal to me. I, and I grew up, um, you know, like when I meet people here and I tell them my background, they're like, that's so unusual. I'm like, well, it wasn't to me when I was growing up. It's, Sure, it's kind of unusual, but there are others. I'm not the only one, right? Um, but then, you know, and I, I've tried to write in my book, um, you know, I tried to write about both countries in a way that felt true to me. Um, and then, you know, you'll read, I, I recently, there was a big story in the Atlantic recently about Saudi Arabia, um, you know, written by a person who is not from there. And, um, he called Saudi Arabia the weirdest country in the world. And it just like, like yeah, stabbed me in the heart, you know? Like, well, first of all, you write this opinion as though it's a fact. And it's not a fact, it's an opinion. Um, and I would never call any country the weirdest country in the world. I might go somewhere and be like, well, that's kind of a weird place, or <laughs> America's kind of weird. But, I, you know, I just seeing places like in that way, it doesn't mean you can't criticize things about a place. Right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it just it just stabbed me in the heart that like I'm like, well, that's a place that I I don't live anymore, but I still love. And it still lives in my heart and the people there live in my heart. And for you to call it that and not even to see that the reason you're calling it that is racism and Islamophobia. 
you would say, no, it really is. Let me give you all these reasons why it's the weirdest yeah. country in the world. And now it's finally becoming normal because they have cinemas and women can drive cars. But what's not normal about loving your family and working for your family every day and loving food and gatherings with your family? Like, all of those are things that we can all relate to, no matter where we're from. So yeah, Iman, I, I, I do think that you're pointing to something very important. And uh, that is that, you know, that when we often talk about the Western style of democracy as well, that every place has its own cultural nuances, which are totally acceptable in that country. I am in no way endorsing human rights abuses in any country. But but, you know, uh, I often hear about this, like the practice of arranged marriages in many South Asian cultures. I myself had an arranged marriage. And, and there is, in, in that cultural context, it is a completely acceptable thing. Uh, it does not mean abuse. It does not mean um, excessive power on the part of parents or in the part, it's not a system of patriarchy. It is just something that happens there, right? So yeah, Maria. one of the things, speaking of what you brought up and what you just spoke to, it's uh, very unique to the American experience that um, America judges everybody by our point of view and what we think is the right way. And I've, I've not seen that so much in other countries or other cultures as much as it's ingrained in American culture. To judge everybody else's way as being wrong because it's not the same way we do it. But doesn't mean the way we do it is the right way. It's just our way and that's good. And they have their way and that's okay too. And, but it's very, uh, something that I've struggled with as long as I've grown up here, I, I was six. So I literally just grew up here. I have everything that's ingrained in me, um, from, you know, being American is to judge. And it's, it's without hesitation, we judge other people's way of doing things. Um, at all times, in, in everything. Oh, their food's too spicy. Oh, their clothes are too colorful. Oh, you know, why do they have arranged marriages? But you know what? There are many happy arranged marriages and there are many divorced arranged marriages and there's many happy love marriages and there's many divorced love marriages. So who says one is right and one is wrong? But we as Americans feel very comfortable saying to other people, you're wrong and we're right. And I think that's one of the things that I've struggled with as an American to, to accept that as the culture here. Um, and stop looking, um, stop being mad at America for being that way. Because again, like, same thing, you know, just the way they judge Islamic countries, they judge India. Oh, it's so overcrowded. Oh, it's overpopulated, so dirty. And I'm like, that's my country. I love that country. I could go there all the time and live there all the time and be completely content and happy, even though I grew up here. So nothing says their way or others' way of doing it is wrong. It's just different. Yeah. Justin, let me come back to you. <laughs> Um, and this is, again, a continuation of the same conversation on finding belonging. And that is that, uh, are there any rituals or cultural uh, things from your uh, home country that have stayed with your family? And do you feel that you are able to practice them with openness here in the United States? And I do. And I, you know, first, knowing my language, keeping it was very important. And it was so important to me that when I met my husband, you know, who did not speak Spanish, I said to him, I won't marry you until you learn Spanish because he needed to speak to my grandmother and my mother. Um, and to this day, like now he does Duolingo every single night and he speaks Aww. it, he speaks it with an American accent, but he speaks it. He loves my culture, my food, my music. Um, which is so important. Um, you know, I, I have been able to um, keep my language, our food, it's so important, the music, um, the way we get together as a family, you know, when we all get together, sometimes we'll just uh, cook and play domino. Um, and it's just important to have that sense of, of, of our roots and, and what we share, like the language and the music and the food um, as well. And for my kids, it was so important that when they were in the fourth and sixth grade, my husband and I took them out of school and sent them to the Dominican Republic for a semester from August to December. And we asked permission at the schools so that they can learn the language. 
um, because they did not know it as well. And when they went there, I remember I would drop them as because my husband and I took turns, drop them at school, and they would cry because they didn't speak the language as well. But you know, within kids are so resilient. And within a month, they were speaking the language. They had friends. And I have my kids love Dominican Republic, just like they love um, you know, Ukrainian, uh, the culture, because my husband is part Ukrainian um, and Italian, and they love that as well. Um, so I think that for my husband and I, it's important for my kids to know where I come from and who their mother is and why I make decisions the way I do. And sometimes I'll say to them, I remember when they were little, I would say, do you want the American mom or the Dominican mom? <laughs> okay. I said, the American mom, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to reason with you. The Dominican mom, let me take my child. <laughs> yeah. off. You know, so it's like, they, they know that and they, they always laugh about it, but it's, it's important. It's important to, uh, for them to have an appreciation of where I come from. Iman, would you like to go? Um, yeah, it's it's hard because, um, you know, there isn't a big uh, population of, of Saudi Americans. Saudis don't, haven't tended to migrate. Um, and, you know, in the Arab American community, there are more folks from other parts of the Arab world. So, um, you know, I don't have access to like Saudi culture around us here. Um, but um, I, the, the article you were talking yes. about that I wrote, um, so there was a, a, an Arabic uh, a translation magazine um, called Arab Lit, um, and they did recently did an issue on folk. Um, and so they wanted people to write about folk literatures, folk songs. Um, and I thought, oh, well, maybe I could write something about the songs my dad used to sing to me when I was a kid. Um, there were um, there were some lullabies and some little like, you know, game songs, kind of like Bring Around the Rosie and London Bridge um, in Arabic. Um, and so I asked my dad, hey, will you um, um, write down some of those songs you used to sing to me? And so he wrote them down. And with each one, he wrote a little almost like anthropological couple of paragraphs about like how they used to practice them and how they used to sing them and describing like there was one song he used to sing to me called um, Doha Ya Doha. Um, where he would put me on his legs um, with a pillow and rock me on his legs. And he did this for my brothers as well. Um, and I did it with my kids when they were really little. Um, but it was, that was not just something my dad did. It was a cultural practice, right? Um, and so I, I, I wrote this article about, um, about the songs and about how my dad teaching them to me, you know, when I was really little, we lived in the States. So he was teaching them to me in Ohio. He had grown up in Mecca. And so he was basically kind of reproducing the Meccan household in a completely new place in a completely new era. Um, and, and that gave me that writing that essay gave me the opportunity to first of all, you know, pull some things out of my dad's brain um, and learn some things about his childhood. Like he talked about this song about, um, it's called Yamathara Hatli Hatli, Rain, Fall, Fall. And I, and I started thinking about um, rain, rain, go away that my mom <laughs> sang to me. And it was like, well, my mom was singing me songs about making the rain go away. And my dad was teaching me songs about making the rain fall <laughs> because they didn't have a lot of rain, yeah. right? And I, I don't know if you know the, the um, in the uh, rain, there's a rain prayer um, that they sometimes do when it's been a drought. And one of the things you do at the end of the prayer is you, you, you take your head scarf or whatever and you turn it the other way as sort of a new beginning. And so I kind of connected that to 
um, my dad said that when the rain did fall, they would run out and they would sing this song um, in the street um, until they got drenched. <laughs> and then they would go back inside. So it, it was, I learned new things about that, but then I was also to compare it with the other cultural knowledge that I have. And, you know, it's like kids in different countries may sing about rain in different ways but in all these places their families are teaching them these songs and children are teaching them to each other and sisters and brothers are learning from each other and that's the thing that that we all experience mm -hmm. right that's beautiful yeah <laughs> maria would you uh, so first I want to say I admire and respect the Spanish culture so much for retaining their language and I envy it because, you know, you, I've never seen any other culture who's been able to do that, to keep that language so firmly within their generations. Even, you know, you could be second, third generation here, but still, my God, fluent Spanish. And um, so we tried that in our home when my oldest was born. We only spoke Urdu to her and she only learned Urdu. She only spoke Urdu for the first three years of her life. Um, and then you know, because we didn't let her watch TV until she was three. Uh, and then she started watching television. And so um, slowly but surely, it, it went away and English replaced it. And then it became easy. So my husband didn't speak Urdu very fluently. Um, but because my daughter only spoke Urdu, he had to learn it better. Um, and so at our home, we only spoke Urdu to each other. We grew up uh, with also grandparents who didn't speak any English. So um, our generation managed to retain it for the most part. Not my cousins that were born here, not my cousins that... Um, you know, mostly grew up here, but my immediate, my siblings and myself managed to maintain it um, for the most part in our generation. Um, but interestingly, I actually really enjoy American food more than I enjoy Indian food. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm the girl that eats out while my poor mom who lives with us cooks meals for us and my children eat that food and my husband eats that food, but I like to eat out. So I usually eat out before I get home. Um, and so the food has stayed in the house, but um, I myself am not a huge, uh, huge partaker in it. Uh, but otherwise, pretty much all the Indian culture we've managed to maintain in our home. Um, we wear the clothes. Uh, we attend all the festivals and all the celebrations. We go to mosque regularly. Um, I'm actually a director of the mosque, um, our local mosque. And so we're very actively involved there. Uh, so most of our culture we have managed to hold on to. Um, and I hope my girls uh, will carry most of it forward. I, you know, I always tell my husband, if we give 100% of our culture to them, they might carry 50% forward. If we only give them 50%, they're only going to carry 25% forward. So let's try to give them 100%. Um, when my oldest was born, I said, we're going to go to India every year. And she's going to, she's going to identify as an Indian, I tell you. And she was nine the first time we met. So it didn't really happen the way I hoped it would. Um, but, but I do think if you ask my girls, I think one time one of them said, uh, I said, where are you from? She said, I'm American. I'm like, <gasps> what? No, you're American Indian. Um, so I, I'm hoping that that they will carry that forward with them, that there is 50% of them is Indian, even though they were born here, um, that there's a half of them, 100, like my husband's also Indian, so 100% culturally is Indian, or I say genetically is Indian, um, but 50% of their, their culture and their background and um, their traditions should hopefully be Indian. 100% would be great though, girls, so try for that, please. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, I would love to know that what would, um, and each of you can take a moment on this, that uh, what would you like uh, those of us who have been here for a while now to know uh, when new Americans come, what are they looking for? How can we make America a better and more inclusive place for new Americans in schools, in communities, in neighborhoods? I think as a policymaker, we pass a lot of policies to do that, right? In our schools, um, the curriculum, what is taught, um, in our communities, helping nonprofits have resources so they can help the person who comes here um, be able to have uh, what they need to make it, um, as a state to be open to immigrants, you know, to take in refugees, to make sure that we have resources when they get here, that they can apply for Medicaid, right? That they're able to get aid. Um, so as a policymaker, we're very conscious of that because our budget reflects our value system, just like at home, your checkbook reflects your value system. 
So we're constantly making sure that we um, are innovative and progressive, right, as a state and we pass laws that help the immigrant community um, as well. Um, I have a bill right now that I, I'm introducing. I introduced, and last night we got it out of committee, it's coming to the floor this week, that expands Medicaid to pregnant undocumented women um, because it's so important for the to have healthcare, right? Yeah. Many of these women end up in the ER, which is the most expensive care, and we end up paying a lot more money because the matching is very different, that if we were to have a waiver to cover them, they can get care while they're pregnant and they can get care a year after giving birth because the maternal mortality rate, especially for black women, is four times higher than white women and Latinas. So as a policymaker, that is always in my mind. How can I make life better, not just for immigrants, for everyone in Maryland, the six million people that live here um, as well. And I know I have, I go on, on a radio show every Monday for the last like five, 15 years with Alejandro Carrasco, who owns Radio America. And it's called Calentando la Mañana, Warming Your Mornings. And he allows me to pick the topic for every Monday morning. And I, I'm very intentional about what I'm going to speak about, especially for the immigrant community. So I talk about how do you register to vote? You know, how do you get a permit, you know, to make improvement in your home? How to become involved in your kid's school? How to become involved in the civic association and be part of that community? How to come to Annapolis and voice you know, your opinion on bills that we're going to pass that affect you. I try to use it as a tool to inform. I don't like to say educate, but to inform the community, to empower them to have those tools so they can live here, right? And be able to reach their goals, but also contribute to make it better. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for your work. I do have a follow-up question. Um, so let's say if as a citizen, I do want, a voice, want my voice heard and know my policymakers and local area leaders to know um, that uh, it's important for me that Maryland is and continues to be a welcoming state and we would love to have more refugees and immigrants in our neighborhoods. What's the best way to do that? Is there a number we can call at? Or, so there's yeah. an office um, that we have that is in charge of the immigrant and refugee affairs. Um, and I can give you that, I'll send it to you. Okay. There's also the governor's office, who's the one, right? The, so we pass all these bills and he decides whether he's gonna sign it, whether he's gonna veto it, or whether he'll allow it to go into law without his signature. Um, and that is important to be make sure that this year, April, June 28th is our primary. In Maryland, you have 141 delegates, 47 senators, the House and the Senate. Every bill has to pass identical. Then the governor decides whether he's going to sign it. June 28th, you get to vote. You get to vote. We vote every four years. You get to vote for your governor, for your delegates, for your senators, for the county council, for some board of election members, for some you know, uh, judges. But this year is so important. And elections matter. Elections have consequences. Mm -hmm. Your voice is so important. So, you know, inform yourself about the different platforms for all the different people running for governor, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, an independent or a Green Party, because it really matters who represents you because those policies, okay, and no offense to, to people um, that are Republicans here because this is a nonpartisan event, but I must tell you, as a Democrat, the that that bill that I put in for the uh, you know immigrant uh, um, expansion of of Medicaid on the floor, it will be a battle mm -hmm. because the Republicans will fight it, um, and and that is really the truth. Mm -hmm. And you have to choose someone that represents your value system, your principles. Someone who's going to see at all of us and not judge. Someone who's going to see at all of us and accept us. Someone who's going to look at all of us and welcome us and realize that together we're stronger and that we have a lot to contribute. Thank you, Jocelyn. That's amazing. 
Iman? What? Yeah, um, don't don't keep people out before they even come in is uh, what I would say. Um, and in the conversations around Ukrainian refugees, we have seen people point out how um, there are assumptions about who can fit in and become part of so-called Western cultures and who cannot. Um, and that is basically that some people are seen as more human than others. Um, you know, conversations about, well, these people can assimilate and those people can't, that, like, what is assimilation? What, you know, um, that, that people uh, don't deserve our help or our, you know, um, or to be part of our society because we think they are less human than others are. Um, so I think opening our minds first is the important thing and realizing what people have in common um, and, and, and taking apart those, those racist assumptions that keep people out before they can even stand in front of the door. Maria? Um, for, for me, uh, truly, it's the American culture learning to show some kindness and some grace to the new ones, to the people that are coming that are probably not asking to be in the situation specifically like the refugees um, who are here because their countries uh, are no longer a place that they can stay. Um, so specifically to, if we speak of Afghan refugees, you know, there are a lot of them that have come that are Shia Afghan refugees. And the reason that they've had to leave the country is because they're persecuted at exorbitantly higher levels by the Taliban. So they're coming here not because they want to come, not because they want to leave their homes, but because they don't have a choice, because they will die, they will be killed. And so having these... Um, these policies and these options for them when they get here to be able to assimilate, not, I, again, you know, America likes to present itself as this big melting pot. Uh, you know, we always throw that around, that that idea that we're a melting pot. But the fact is, I don't think we're a melting pot. We're, we're very lumpy, if you look at it in that way. Like, you know, we're very concentrated on, you know, certain groups are acceptable and certain aren't. So you can only throw certain people into this melting pot and that, then we'll take them in and we're happy to take them in. But otherwise, we're not interested. Um, and so uh, I think that's one of the, the concepts that I thought of when I thought of America as a child was that, oh, you can come here and everybody accepts you and, you know, everyone is welcome. And I think that has gradually changed over time. And it might have been true maybe when we first got here. I don't know. But I know that it's not the truth now. Um, and I think we need to we need to address that. We need to show some grace and some kindness. You know, my, one of the big cultural things that I grew up with was was giving, giving and donating. Right. So the concept is God gives you if you have more than others, God has given it to you to be almost a vessel to give to others. But a lot of the, the culture around here in America is, oh, this is all mine. Don't take any of mine. You can't have mine. And uh, I guess that's a big, biggest cultural change in my own brain versus becoming truly an American is that I, I never looked at this as mine. I look at it as, as this is mine to give to others. Like I've been given more than I need and therefore it is my job to give to others. But I don't think the majority of the country feels that way. And, and it becomes, uh, again, a partisan issue because it is, it is the mentality of some that, you know, don't touch mine. Mine is mine. It's, I'm not here to help. That's, I worked hard to get this. I don't need to give it to anybody else. But again, there are people coming to this country who aren't asking to be here and don't don't think this is the ideal situation for them. They don't want to be on Medicaid. Nobody wants to be on Medicaid, guys. But unfortunately, that's that's the situation they're in. And you know, if if a little extra comes out of our pockets when you're doing these policies, uh, if our taxes go up a little bit, is that really is that really as bad as we like to make it out in our heads? But it is. It is for some people. It is that bad because it's like, oh, you're taking away from me, and and this is mine, and I shouldn't have to give. And and I think if we could all learn just to open that 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 pocket a little bit and just see that there's others who are much more in need than us. There'll always be somebody who needs more than you do. There's always going to be, and you'll probably have more than you need anyway. So if we can start um, changing that mentality in our heads as Americans to say, hey, we have the capacity to help. We have the capacity to help so much. We have land. We have infrastructure. We have money we have resources like what what is the limit of america if we really wanted to help but we only want to help when we want to help and that's i think one of the things we need to change is rather than just you know looking at it where where it's beneficial to us if we looked at it as who needs it it would change the way we behave in a lot of things thank you maria that's it.
I know we can have this conversation for hours, but in the interest of time, I do have a couple of audience questions. Uh, so one of them is, and any one of you or all of you can take it, it's coming as a female immigrant, different culture, backgrounds, religions. How do you overcome that innate fear of being different, perhaps not good enough or smart enough to reach this successful place where you are today? Sure. It's one of the things I thought about when you were talking about having the confidence after, you know, coming here and, and having to do things that you didn't expect to do, you know, building that confidence. And I was thinking during that time, you know, it's interesting because these experiences can give you confidence or they can break you. There's really two ways that a person can go. And and so we are lucky, the three of us uh, up here, the four of us, that these experiences didn't break us. But I think they break a lot of people. And I think that um, that's that's really a scary thought that, you know, the, the behavior that we exhibit to these um, immigrants can really shape their their futures permanently. Um, and so the ones that you're breaking, they're never going to find their way. They're always going to be lost. And so think about that when before you take those steps that end up breaking that person, you know, find finding and giving this immigrant confidence and this immigrant confidence and this semi-immigrant confidence <laughs> um, is, is amazing. And part of it probably is our personalities as well. But there are people who who don't um, have it in them. So it's very easy to break those people. And I think that if we don't give some thought to that, that our choices and our decisions are going to break someone um, and, and, and affect many lives, not just that one singular life, but the children that that person brings into this world and generations to come. Um, there, there's, there's a lot that can, that can happen if we don't think about our choices. I would also like to add to what Mariam said about, you know, it can break people. I personally, when I started the Becoming American Project, I did personally know people who I felt had very strong stories to share, but not all of them. In fact, today, as I look back, I don't think any of them wanted to share that because of fear of what may come. And these were the stories that I really wanted people to hear. So uh, still working on them and uh, praying and hoping that uh, one day they will have courage to tell their story. Um, another question, uh, this is specifically for you, Iman, and this is uh, this will be our last question for the day. What would you like to say to the publishing industry about opening the landscape to more voices? What words of encouragement would you give to would you give to a writer working to break into the industry? Um, more publishers um, and, you know, money people of color as well. Um, more book, people were talking about this on Twitter recently, more book reviewers mm -hmm. of color um, because I think recently there was a book people were talking about that was published five years ago and they were questioning it its content and I went back and, and read a bunch of the book reviews of it and they, it was reviewed I think mainly by white writers. Um, so more book reviewers of color. Um, I mean, I, I think the words of encouragement are you, there, there are things that you can control as a writer and things that you can't. So you can control what you write, you can control sitting down at your desk every day you can control, you know, your goals of getting something done by a certain time. You can control sitting down and applying for a grant or an opportunity. You can't control whether people give it to you. You can't control whether an editor publishes you. Um, you can't control um, whether readers buy your book, right? Um, but you can tr control how you show up to them, you can control your interactions with readers. Um, you can control the way that you interact with other writers and the generosity that you show them. Um, and so in the end, um, it's sort of about managing expectations about what you can do and what you can't. And then when there are things that it's like, well, I can't control whether an editor publishes me and I see that they're is um, that there are barriers in the industry. What can you do to speak out about those things? What can you do to 
um, to change those things, if anything, um, and think about that. Because I think it, it's easy to be like, when you're, when you're writing and you're hitting barriers before I got published, I know there were times when I was like, this is never going to happen and I'm just going to give up. And my husband was like, no, (laughs) (laughs) don't do that. So have people in your corner, um, who can tell you, you know, it's not you, it's them keep working on it. Um, Thank you, Iman. And Iman will be downstairs on the second floor to sign her books for anyone who's interested. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all our panelists, for your time and coming out this morning. I would like to invite Carla Dupree for her final comments. Or maybe it's Tracy. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, One more round of applause for our incredible panel, Becoming American. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, all of you in the audience. Thank you, everyone here virtually as well. Um, As Sama said, we have a book signing downstairs on the second floor. So you can just leave Wheeler Auditorium and take the elevator or go down the steps. Um, We also have programs for the rest of the day. We've got incredible programming until four o'clock. And we also have evaluations that when you're leaving, um, if you'd like to do it via your phone, we have a QR code on the table. Um, So again, thank you everyone. And we are so glad you're here for City Lit Festival. Thank you.